Good afternoon, good evening, uh, colleagues. Welcome to this uh, book launch of uh, one of our fellows, 2022 Steers Fellow, uh, who actually upped up the records uh, for being the youngest fellow that we have received so far and very active. So we would like to welcome Jonathan back, uh, Jonathan Kingdon. Uh, who is going to uh, launch, and, and we're very pleased that this is going to be the first launch of the book. And so it's not just uh, a Stellenbosch or Steers or South African, but an international launch of this uh, wonderful book that uh, Professor Michael Cherry is going to speak to and introduce um, um, our guest, uh, uh, Jonathan in this in this respect. So I would like to welcome all of you that have taken time to come. I would like also to welcome all our colleagues who have signed up. Um, special um, reference is also given to I think some members that have signed up from Macquarie University where Jonathan taught for quite some time. So if they've managed to sign up, I would like to welcome them as well. Uh, so this evening or afternoon, we're going to have uh, uh, introduction by uh, Michael uh, of, uh, of, of, of Jonathan, and then we'll have an interaction between the two of them. And at the end of that, uh, we will then have um, a, signing in, a signing of the book and official launch of that book. Um, and I'm sure that uh, a lot of you are looking at it you can't wait to get your hands on to that book. Uh, but let me introduce uh, uh, Professor Michael Cherry, who is going to take. Uh, Michael does have a connection with, uh, with Jonathan that he did his PhD at the Department of Zoology at the Balliol uh, College, Oxford. Um, and so I think that uh, um, they must have run, um, uh, or he must have seen the damage that uh, Jonathan had done before that he got there. Uh, but since it was still there, then it means that uh, some uh, good things were still happening. So um, I would like to welcome uh, uh, Professor Cherry and thank you very much uh, for uh, agreeing to, to introduce um, the, the author and also to have a conversation uh, with, um, with, with him. Uh, we will then have an opportunity to have a glass of wine and water outside. And fortunately for those online, they don't have that privilege, but uh, uh, it's, it's one way of telling them that they should come to steers. Um, and so um, I think then I'll hand over to, uh, to Michael to do the in introductions and the discussions of the book. Thank you. So, Michael. So thanks, Edward. It's uh, quite a daunting task to introduce Jonathan because um, if you don't already know, he's a bit of a polymath. Um, he, he was born in Tanzania and uh, his father was a colonial officer there, and he spent um, the first, um, the sort of formative years of, of his life there. And m he was moved all around. So if you read the book, you'll find out that he, he's, he lived in virtually every part of Tanzania. Uh, but then he went to Britain, to, to St. Edward's uh, School in Oxford for high school. And then after high school, uh, f following on a... Um, real inspiration from his mother, who was a fabulous artist, he did his formal training in fine art in London, and after which he went back to East Africa, or Central Africa, I should say, to Makere University to lecture in the fine arts department. And um, he, was, he worked there for 15 years and ended up as professor of fine art at, at quite a young age, but in the same 
time, he acquired a secondary appointment, or I don't know if it was a secondary appointment, uh, but an equally important appointment um, in the zoology department. Um, so he was an academic staff member in two, f two different fields. And um, anyway, if, if you've read the book, or once you read the book, uh, you'll see just how significant this, these two fields in tandem have been uh, to, his, to his career as a scholar. Um, but I think I should stop there and not uh, tell you anymore because the way this is going to work is he's going to give us a short presentation and tell us something about the book. And after that, he and I will have a, um, I, I will ask him a few, a, a few questions about that. But um, suffice to say that having left um, Makeri after 15 years there, um, he continued to work um, in various institutions throughout the world, but his permanent base, he returned to Oxford, uh, to the university, and that's where, in fact, um, we met in the mid-80s when I was a graduate student. Um, it was Jonathan was actually associated with the same research group that I was, that I was, that, that I was in. But um, having left McCary, he uh, did, he wrote two, a, a really important book, which is what most people uh, for which he's known as in, in the biological world, and not, when I say a book, a series of books, a seven-volume series on African mammals and their evolution and, and biogeography. And that is still uh, a standard text in the, uh, or standard reference work, I should say, rather because it's not a text in the field. Um, and that was completed in the 12 years, so over, after a long period, that, that after he left Makeri. But... Um, He's also very well known as, a, as an artist, and um, his beautiful wildlife, um, his guide to African mammals, which was published in the late 90s, is also um, th the best guide uh, that one can get to African mammals. Uh, so over to you, Jonathan, and um, we're looking forward to hearing about this book. Well, thank you very much indeed. They were very generous. Thanks. Wonderful to see you all here, and many, many old friends and very happy faces for me, anyway. Um, what I want to uh, talk about now is a kind of combination of readings from the book itself. It's a slightly contrived way of presenting the book uh, in quotations, but I've kind of restructured it so that in half an hour I can cover uh, what I think is the sort of broad outline of the book. But an audio book has been made, and I can tell you it was the most grueling experience to actually uh, do an audio book because you're put inside a little cocoon, totally uh, soundproofed. And therefore, any extraneous sound other than your voice is recorded with quite startling uh, clarity. So I had stomach rumbles r rather <laughs> frequently. And so it took two weeks to, to read the entire book and have uh, an audio book made from uh, all the rumbles had to be completely taken out so that some poor bugger sitting in a console had to take all out all my stomach rumbles. So anyway, it was quite an adventure to do it. Uh, and if you really want to hear it minus the stomach rumbles, then you can buy it. Um, now, um, I'm now going to actually read this as and it is mostly quotations from the book, but you'll probably notice that it's a slightly contrived combination. Now, uh, I don't know if we can reduce this, because you can't see much color there. Can we actually uh, make it down here? Because I'm all right here. That's more like it, right. So, Origin Africa is about the land where humanity originated, about an old but fertile continent, 
that bears the most diverse array of living things on planet Earth. The second largest continent, but host to the richest array of animals, especially mammals, the group to which we humans belong, especially primates, the group to which we belong, and to hominids, also the group to which we belong. Most of the ancestors, well, I've got to press the right button or we're in terrible trouble. Um, Most of the ancestors of today's mammals, including our own, have made forays both in and out of Africa. Indeed, our ancestral lineage, primates, first arrived as tiddly, palm-sized palm animals immigrating from Eurasia, but that was more than 60 million years ago. Well, certainly more than 50 million years. We don't know exactly when they came in. If we're to try plumb such ancestral depths, we must be prepared to safari far and wide across Africa, but also try to look deep into time. But where on earth do we begin? As it happens, there is a single cataclysmic apocalyptic event that gave birth to the tertiary era, and the tertiary era is the one to which we belong. When a comet or asteroid named Chicxulub we better get used to this word, Chicxulub, because I'm going to use it to describe uh, this comet or asteroid, which, like a bullet from outer space, hit planet Earth in today's Caribbean 66 million years ago. As Chicxulub approached Earth, a lesser chunk of that same asteroid, now named Nadir, broke away to hit West Africa's coast. As if these two bombardments were not enough, India, at that time a wayward island cruising northwards across the Indian Ocean. We have to think very differently about the world uh, because we think of India as just South Asia now, but in those days it was an island all on its own, way out in the Indian Ocean. Anyway, this wayward island exploded 66 million years ago into a series of gigantic outpourings of molten lava, which are today called the Deccan Traps. This explosion, this succession of ex explosions, generated tsunamis and smothering poisonous clouds. And these were dismal heralds for the birth of our era. So let the first of our safaris begin at 66 million years ago. We're talking about slices of time that are, well, even our um, parents, sometimes our grandparents, um, would have found incomprehensible, meaningless. Even we contemporary pupils sitting in the infant schools of science. And that's how I envisage us today. We're not living in the, the final stages of science. Science is new. Science is something that is just being born. We are in an infant school of science. We can feel 
overwhelmed by the magnitude of the challenge that all these scientific discoveries present to our minds, our perceptions, and our capacity for action. Even as discovery after discovery emerges before our marveling minds. Furthermore, virtually all scientific knowledge is new, 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 new in some sense or other. In the case of Nadir, its crater was identified in 2022. The Chicxulub impact was discovered and published in 1980. The code for DNA, the genetic copying mechanism whereby life comes from life, and creator of the proteins in which all life is coded. This was only cracked in 1953 when I was 17. The first indication of human origins in southeastern Africa emerged only in 1924 with the description of a three-year-old child's fossil skull named Southern Manape Australopithecus. Then Mendel's genes, the very word genes and genetics, first acquired that name in 1909 when my father was seven years old. During his father's lifetime, my grandfather's lifetime, the modern science of biology came into being with the 1859 publication of Origin of Species. Every one of us is a novice, both in science and in our evolutionary arrival as a new species on Earth. Furthermore, we are novices on a on a scene that is crowded with elders, animals and plants that were here long, long before we appeared on the scene. As I write in my preface, the pages that follow are informed by a new exploratory language loaded with messages from our ancestors. We are still learning how to translate those messages, most of them, like us, originating in Africa. The molecules of genes, themselves coded messages, offer us new grammars, a new syntax that is embedded in all living things or I should say living beings, not things. These languages and their messages are new, new, new. Yet the lessons we must learn require a complete reframing of knowledge itself. Knowingly or not, we have entered an age of learning in which everyone's lifelong commitment to ever expanding knowledge has become the defining quest of contemporary culture. Furthermore, we must act on this always imperfect but always growing knowledge, not just for ourselves, but for the survival of our children's children. Origin Africa consists of 22 chapters in which we move on swiftly from Africa as, well, it's really Afro-Arabia, 
as the core of Gondwana land to the consequences of Chicxulub for an Africa that was essentially a mega island at that time entirely surrounded by wide stretches of sea. Had Chicxulub Nadir missed Earth, we can be reasonably certain that dinosaurs would still, still dominate Earth's fauna and nothing even remotely like a human being would ever have evolved under those circumstances. Thus, my third chapter title is Consequences from Chance. The biological consequences of a planet subject to the occasional collision plus repeated cycles of global wobbles and extreme oscillations in climate. The evolution of mammals or animals is of course inseparable from that of plants. Indeed we sometimes need reminders that no animal including humans, can exist in the absence of plants. Remembering that plants have inspired many human cultures, I designed a series of book covers in which vignettes of flowers or trees, framed miniature silhouettes of the many mammals that I have tried to, to, to study. That humans have appreciated and studied plants for millennia is well expressed by rock paintings in Africa. This is my own tracing of one from Zimbabwe, tentatively dated at some 8,000 years ago. So, Khoikhoi people were recording plants in this sort of detail many thousands of years before the pyramids of Egypt were built. Among the survivors, among the survivors of still earlier catastrophes were many ecological elders, including spiders, scorpions, some fish and some frogs, as well as a few mammals now called Afrotheres, mammals of Africa. Among those surviving mammals were the ancestors of elephants. Here is how my eight-year-old self remembered his friendship with the little round-headed, knock-kneed, big-eared, and very hairy companion. I was firmly convinced that he liked me as much as I did him. He was certainly greedy for constant companionship. He would come and wrap his trunk around my head and with its fingered tip probe with gentle yet insistent movements into my ears, my nose, my mouth, even very gently my eyes, and we watched one another uh, continuously because our eyes seemed to be our greatest commonality. I had no trunk, and my ears were pathetic <laughs> compared to his. He was quite content to walk on four legs, and he did not seem to mind his lack of fingers. His eyes always watched mine attentively for any reciprocal activity change, and he enjoyed wrestling my wrists and hands with his infinitely maneuverable little trunk. It was as if he was determined to demonstrate that there was nothing I could do with my hands that he could not do just as well with his trunk. Our fellowship was all about touching and being touched. Am I being anthropomorphic? My father certainly thought so. 
No, for one moment I was being proboscomorphic. I was sharing pure emotion with an elephant. I was reinforcing my conviction that the joys of existence, of life, of living, are both shareable and were actually shared. Turning from now time to deep time, from today to an Africa or Afro-Arabia entirely surrounded by sea. Anything that could fly, like bats, be blown, swim, or be rafted had the potential of reaching Africa. But larger terrestrial animals had to find less watery ferries. They needed firm bridges or suitable corridors. And only when northward cruising Africa, or I should say Afro-Arabia, began to bump into Eurasia, did terrestrial pathways between continents become possible. It, it, it's actually a big, a big challenge to our perceptions to realize that this huge continent has been moving northwards and slowing as it goes, like a huge sort of very slow island, which is in fact what it is. Oh, yes, here we are. Chapter 7 sketches in some features of intercontinental emigration and immigration. Today's wealth of species is due to much coming and going by all manner of plants and animals. And here is the record of rodent arrivals from Eurasia. Like our own lineage, the first to arrive is thought to have come some 50 or more millions of years ago. In their accumulations, in the dramas of their lives, past and present, in their abundance, many in their precarious rarity, I hear the voices of ancestors whispering, yelling, crying, and threatening from all corners all across our great continent. Are we deaf or am I a fantasist? I wrote this book during the COVID pandemic, aware as never before of how the study of biology transforms the way we understand nature. Diseases and plagues are now more fully understood to be our own and all other creatures' ultimate fearsome predators, more than the lions and crocodiles that were once feared so much more. No. Diseases are much more predatory. I was reminded of a commission that I shared with two colleagues in which we were asked to paint the ceiling panels of our chapel with symbols from the Book of Revelations. And this particular uh, panel was my take on the many headed pandemics that have always and will continue to plague both our physiological and our pharmaceutical defenses. Another sort of comprehension of the workings of evolution, we now know that variations in the actual behavior of ephemeral living beings ultimately determines the size the shape, the structure, the colors, the patterns, and much else of those still behaving survivor descendants. I've contracted uh, observations on that topic into chapter headings in the book. One lists 
the smaller, the bigger, the faster, the slower, the louder, the quieter, followed by the assertive title, Behavior Drives Morphology. And I would urge you to actually consider that because it is contrary to all our normal perceptions. Something as ephemeral as behavior is actually determining the shape of future generations, of future animals and plants. At this point, let me digress. A naked human being comes in various shades of brown or pink, but apart from sparkling white teeth and sclera around the iris, we are actually rather colorless. So it should be, so it should, should it be surprising that some people might feel shamed or at least challenged by the colorful magnificence of so many evolved beings around them? I grew up on the margins of Serengeti, watching courier friends making themselves up for dances that sought to match the displays and ceremonies of fellow plains dwellers. The men borrowed the plumes of ostriches. They pronked like gazelles. They pranced like cranes on clogs, while colobus monkeys uh, provided the tasseled pinafores that swung to drumming that outquired and outsyncopated any colobus chorus. And the colobus chorus is very, very loud, very, very imposing. Their faces became tableau for vivid red patterns borrowed from bishop birds. Now, am I not more beautiful? Yes. Courier maidens are susceptible to beautiful, I mean, they're susceptible to uh, beautiful, beautified men. I was reminded of courier dances when I had the opportunity to visit one of the world's newest islands, Seagirt, Fishgirt, Papua. Most of its former seabed or volcanoes were pushed up by Australia's bruising northward trend, because like Africa, it's sort of going crashing away out into the Pacific. So it has pushed up the seabed itself and created many volcanoes as they're going. And all this is the result of Australia's move northwards into the Pacific. The physical isolation of Papua together with its exceptional fertility, presented its first incoming colonists with a situation found nowhere else except on the top of its mountains. The uh, island realm presented a cornucopia of food, especially fruit, while some other hazards of mainland life, such as predators and competitors, were rare or absent. In an aside from the main themes of origin Africa, this is how I have learned to imagine a uniquely Papuan story. Among the earliest colonists of Papua were a few dowdy crows. And this is a, a descendant relative a remnant that lives way up in the cold snow mountains. Among the uh, earliest colonists, where are we? Yes, uh, were these were these birds, and the female the females suffered so few constraints they could feed, nest, and raise their crowlets without needing to share the task with a mate, living a sort of avian feminist dream. Their only constraint was a momentary need for sperm. And in choosing what male might be allowed the privilege 
of copulation, they not only became exceptionally picky, they demanded dazzlement. It was not only the male females that lived in an avian paradise. Male crows, free of all domestic chores, could devise and stage ever more elaborate dances and develop ever more inventive foreplay, which is what the females demanded before granting their favors. Immured on these fruitful, nearly predator-free islands, Crows became birds of paradise. Taking choreographed contrasts in color, shape, outline, movement, and iridescent bling to extremes. Take that avian pole dancer, the Wilson's bird of paradise. That's my rendering of it. A small crow that performs its histrionics around a beak pruned stem sprouting from the forest floor. On this miniature stage, the performance follows a practiced routine consisting of ever more surprising flashes of contrasting and previously concealed colors. Hidden tracts of vermilion red on the bird's broad back and rump are followed by the opening of a perfect disc of stark metallic green, the bird's thin, but very extensive rough. That's this great disc here. Throughout the show, two delicate feather spirals quiver in front of the tail, subtly hinting at oversight by two empty ghostly eyes. A bold sky blue pate is the only feature shared by a flashy pole dancer and any female that condescends to be his audience. His act culminates in a single flash of searing yellow from a tract of canary yellow feathers on his nape. And finally, revelation of a triangular yellow gape so sudden and so surprising that even the human heart can miss a beat or two. This model was made in homage to my friend and fellow lover of birds of paradise, David Attenborough. Papillon women, like courier bachelorettes, challenge their men to try match the evolved creativity of birds in elaborate, entrancing, sing-sing dance festivals. Meanwhile, powerful logging firms have built jetties all along Papua's northern shores to carry away the bird's very habitat. Logs of paradise, logs of paradise destined for, destined for the factories of Asia. Our barbaric, mercantile, business-led culture invests its highest values in dead things, commodities that have no future and ultimately no value. I once attempted a painting that contrasted ephemeral mineral stuff with the durability and the vitality of life. The silhouettes of two birds, similar to known fossils from some 30 million years ago, stalk past the outlines of Kilimanjaro. The title? Old Birds, Young Mountain. Before leaving you to browse copies of the book or view a small display of illustrations, I would like to end on a surprise. Although this classically Darwinian story was, artic uh, was articulated more than 30 years ago, it continues to surprise people. 
including many uh, uh, anthropologists, who have long assumed uh, uh, that a dense layer of melanin embedded in thick skin first evolved in Africa, a complexion now quite widespread. It is verifiably true that a majority of contemporary Africans share dark complexions and some genes with a wide scatter of mostly island seashore people called Melanesians, including the Aboriginal peoples of Australia. After visiting these Pacific regions, I wrote a book published in 1993 that began with the observation that all animals adapt to circumstances, humans too, but human circumstances are essentially self-made, hence the title self-made man. Self-made rafts and or canoes served to isolate their voyaging boat builders as they colonized the almost immeasurably extensive offshore island shores of southwestern Pacific Ocean. Thousands of generations of ad adaptation to a seaside tide-governed subsistence selected for an evolved sunscreen skin, evolved sun hat hair, and quite probably significant levels of genetic resistance to some of the many diseases and infections of the lowland tropics. <clears throat> Watercraft carried Melanesians eastwards out to remote areas of the Pacific. Thousands of islands are, were colonized. Then westwards, out along the uh, Indian Ocean shorelines where the going was a lot easier and they probably reached African shores about 40 to 50,000 years ago. I called the seaside voyagers of this great saga, the Banda Strandopers, in my 1993 book, Self Made Man. Then in 1998, an important genetic study entitled Out of Africa and Back Again, led by Mike Hammer out of Tucson University, uh, University, confirmed that while the original source population of Homo sapiens could indeed be located in southern Africa, a hefty 57% of Hammer's African sample possessed polymorph 5 of the Y chromosome, which could only have arisen in populations that had a genetic history of travel to the Far East and then back to Africa. Seeking further confirmation of the adaptive utility and the physiological consequences of environmentally determined technology, I turned to the far northwest to examine populations of self-made men that had become isolated along the sunless Baltic shores of Scandinavia, concluding that quite opposite adaptations had become necessary, culminating in a population of depigmented people with a complexion quite opposite to that of islanders from the southern tropics. All this is the outcome of almost obsessive, childlike curiosity, something I share with most fellow art scientists. Origin Africa is partly about the child in all of us. Among my personal reminiscences, I present our continent, I present the entire continent as nursery, school, 
and university of human origins. Africa becomes the true primary source of our natural history, our origins, the ultimate setting for future universities of human creative thinking, creative making, creative living. Thank you, Asante, amen. Are these, are these working? Right, good. So you've seen now this marvellous, uh, the, the themes that run this, through this book are um, the evolution of life and particularly of mammals in Africa. Um, and this is interwoven really with Jonathan's, it, it's something of an autobiography as well, I think. It, it, and, and that's what I found um, made it such a charming book. And it's also illustrated with these most beautiful illustrations. And I thought I'd start with a general question. Um, so you may have what I thought, I mean, Jonathan and I share several interests, but one of those is in, in visual ecology and how animals uh, perceive the world and perceive color. And you made a I thought a very, very interesting statement near the end of the book where you said you realized as an art student that cameras didn't process images um, in the same way that human brains do. Um, and you, you say that even the quickest of your sketches um, actually point to how you can present information uh, in a somewhat different way. And yet you also, also attest uh, in the same chapter to how important careful observation is in, in drawing. And I thought it would be nice if you could just elaborate a little bit, um, given that you've had these sort of two remarkable careers that have run in tandem. How has is, how is drawing helped you as a biologist? Um, I think... One of the things about drawing is... Oh, sorry. Am I, am I listening to it? You've just got to hold it to your mouth. I just hold it up. Yeah. Can you hear me all right? All right. Um, I will try and swallow it. Ah. Um, I think that drawing is a much more challenging uh, activity and it is still very far from being fully understood as a capacity of the human hand and the human brain. Drawing actually involves both these things. It involves the hand as the servant of the brain, and it also involves the perceptions of the brain itself, and vision, we must remember, is the most exactly um, or the most uh, proximate aspect of all the senses, because it is the sense that is closest and is the most immediate uh, extension of the brain itself. All that mass of extraordinarily differentiated cells in the, uh, in the eye, every one of them is picking up a different particular uh, Quality, so the the eye shatters uh, everything that it, it sees around it, and it is therefore really capable of being very very confused. And both evolution and culture combine to make it a bit easier to get along with uh, such a difficult physiological. Um, process, the physiological process of seeing, just seeing. It's much more complicated than we think. 
And what, just to take up your, your question, I think the, the thing that drawing does is it starts really with an outline. And I've been very interested in the, um, in the rock art of Africa. And when you look at it very closely, the great majority uh, of these, uh, these drawings, paintings, whatever you like to call them, these expressions of humanities go wanting to share something about what they see uh, on rock, um, if you, if you follow them carefully, they have these outlines, beautifully drawn outlines. Oh, they make you, they make you say, ay, 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 ay. You know, if, how, how marvelously sensitive that man was, or that woman mm. was, 8,000 years ago, before the pyramids of Egypt were, were, were built. Um, they have a sensitivity to the outline and then they fill it in quite roughly sometimes um, so that we see silhouettes. And I think what they often do, it's as though they are remembering the outline of you know, their grandmother or their sister or their aunt or their child or whatever it is, and they're throwing it onto the rock. <clears throat> well, that's not what a photograph does. The photograph only records the uh, the, the tones and the shadows and today the colors of the things that are in front of the lens. But what the human brain is doing is it's particularly sensitive to outlines or it can just take an, an abstract quality and find it in what they are mm -hmm. seeing. So I think that's an aspect of drawing which is neglected by a lot of people. It wasn't neglected by the people of Africa. No. <laughs> uh, 8,000, anything up to yeah. 25,000 years ago, they were making these marvelous images on rocks yeah. and telling us about what was important to them then. Yeah. That's amazing. Now, that's a very interesting perspective. Um, so you lament in the book about how the recent history of Africa, the last few hundred years, has been characterized by trade in humans and in ivory and then in the replacement of uh, wild animals by livestock. And I wondered, uh, you know, uh, how complicit do you think Africans themselves have been in the latter? Obviously, in the first two, <laughs> um, they've been victims. But in the replacement of, of wild animals by livestock, um, I was interested that you threw that one in. Um, it's a very difficult one. It's a very difficult one because it is, it is so widespread. The replacement of the most efficient natural resources of Africa have evolved, both the plants have evolved in response to all the vicissitudes that Africa has gone through. Africa has had terrific contrasts, you know. With it, it, in general, it is a dry continent. The Sahara has been even more extensive than it is today, with great tongues of, of, um, of aridity coming deep down into Nigeria and elsewhere. They're called fixed dunes. But they're deep sand, which was blown, and, and parts of Nigeria were great spans of desert. And these came down, and then there were great expansions of forests. And we're somewhere in between. And I think it's very important to remind people that we have lived just the birth of our civilization as we know it today has been during one of the most optimum, the most benign periods in the, almost in the entire history of man on earth. We, are, we have been exceedingly lucky, exceedingly fortunate in living in such a benign period. And now we're buggering it up. Um, I'm getting a bit away from your question. <laughs> no, no. But no. Um, I do think that people have not given enough attention and not enough respect to the native 
resources of Africa. Yeah. They have accepted that cattle and introduced foods are the staples for us all. And that I challenge, I do challenge that. I think we have, the, the, the livestock industry is a, a villain in my book because it has very deliberately and very politically suppressed any research into indigenous, the adaptations of indigenous animals and indigenous plants. And that must be, rec that must be rectified in my book both in my book, this book, but in my book, metaphorical right. sense. So last question. I mean, this struck me right at the beginning of the book. Um, you know, it's, it's a tremendous irony in a sense that in terms of humans, uh, Africa colonized the world. We were the first colonists. And yet, yet, arguably, in the last 400 years, we've become the worst victims of, of colonialism. Yeah. Um, so I don't know whether you can, uh, <laughs> would you like to comment on that or expand on it, but it did strike me as a, as a remarkable irony in the, in the book. Indeed. Um, I think Africa has been the most misrepresented, the most badly treated uh, continent on earth. I mean, you can, argue, you can argue with that in all sorts of different ways, but Slavery and the ivory trade were very close together, and of course gold and silver and valuable minerals have also always been uh, uh, a bait for outsiders to come. But obviously slavery was the greatest abuse, and it has left a poisonous legacy, particularly in the United States and in other places with a long history of uh, of slavery behind it. That, uh, it. One has to acknowledge that. It's a very important thing to realize what a, 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 a completely unacceptable, completely uh, poisonous legacy this is. Well, in Cape Town, too. Come. I mean, Cape yeah, Town is a yeah, slave city. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so that, that, uh, that has been the product, I think, of very rapid um, technological um, expansion in sort of two, two areas of the world, really, in the Far East and in the Far West. And because people always take advantage of the weapons or the things that they happen to have at that moment, they use it against people who haven't got that. And that's what happened in Africa. You had people who had guns, they had horses, they had ships, and they used them.